Good morning, everyone. Uh, respected chairpersons, uh, really a pleasure and honor to be part of this program. And thank you, uh, Dr. Olika, for such a uh, generous introduction. So I'll be speaking on optic disc evaluation, as Dr. Harsh sir was mentioning. It's a very, very vital topic for glaucoma practitioners, for every student. You know, in a glaucoma evaluation, there are certain key points. For example, intraocular pressure, which is extremely vital for the treatment. Your gonioscopy is extremely vital because you need to classify your patients into open angle, closed angle, and understanding the etiology of glaucoma. Visual fields are important for uh, assessing the grade of glaucoma, understanding the uh, rate of progression of glaucoma. But I personally believe that disc evaluation is the most important evaluation in glaucoma because after all, glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve. And how well you evaluate your optic nerve determines how good a glaucoma expert you are. So disc evaluation, I believe, is the X factor in glaucoma evaluation. In my presentation of 14-15 minutes, I'll be talking about the key disc findings which are important for glaucoma. I'll also discuss the something four, uh, five R's, which you all know, which has been introduced by Professor Vendrup, and we'll share some example to understand how disc evaluation is done. So as I was mentioning, the most important thing in glaucoma is disc evaluation, and disc and field correlation is vital for glaucoma diagnosis. So whenever you see a disc, what the point we need to see is that is there any thinning of the neuroretinal rim? Is there any RNFL thinning which is there, which we need to locate and we need to document. So you can see in this patient, you can see the polar notching, the superior, inferior, the neuroretinal rim has become thin. There are certain common glock findings which we see in optic disc, which we should be aware of. For example, the bayonetic sign, which is a sharp 90 degree turning of the optic vessels when the cup increases in size. In this case, you can see the neuroretinal rim has become thin. You can see the nasalization of central vessels. You can see the presence of disc hemorrhage. So all these findings we need to actively look for in a patient with glaucoma. Again, the bearing of circumlinear vessels where you can see that the blood vessel is basically hanging in the cup because of thinning of the neuroretinal rim. The tissue, you can see a pallor and both sides of the blood vessel which is indicating that this area there is a loss of neuroretinal rim. This is another patient with a bayonetic sign. Laminar dot sign again is very important as there is loss of retinal ganglion cells, the pores of laminar cubrosa increase in size, they become more prominent and which is what we call as the laminar dot sign. We'll come to the five R's which has been first introduced by Dr. Fingrate and Dr. Vainrep, which are extremely useful for a complete evaluation of optic disc. Starting with first, that is the scleral ring size. So we need to determine the size of the optic disc, what we call as the scleral ring. We need to see the neuroretinal rim. We need to actually see which area the rim is thinned out. Also look for the retinal nerve fiber layers. Look for the region of parapapillary atrophy. We'll come to it in detail later on. Also look for retinal and optic disc hemorrhage. So these five things we should try to actively search in every patient where we are suspecting glaucoma. In fact, in every patient who walks into your OPD, starting with the scleral ring, you know, optic discs, they can come in all sizes. All these three discs are actually normal. The problem with us is that because we are so much biased looking at the cup, in a patient with large disc, we tend to over-diagnose glaucoma. And in a patient with a smaller disc like this, we often miss early glaucoma changes because we are very much influenced by the size of the cup. So we need to classify patient into large and small discs. Also, we need to understand that optic disc is like a canal through which the optic nerve fibers pass. So the amount of fiber is same, whether it's a small disc or the large disc. And since it's the same amount of fiber in a small and large disc, in a small disc, you see crowding with a small cup. And in large disc, the fibers are spread around the margin and you see a large cup. So that is why small discs have small cups and large disc will have a large cup. But as I was telling you, whenever you see a small disc, you should be extra careful because these type of subtle changes, a minor inferior rim, th uh, rim thinning, these type of things you may miss in a small disc. And a large disc, again, we have to see the neuroretinal rim, but always understand in a large disc, a large cupping is mostly normal. Now, how to understand the disc size? 
Classically, we have been taught that a small aperture, that is the five degree of Welchelian direct ophthalmoscope, correspond to the normal disc size. So, in case you're using that, you can use it to understand whether the disc size is normal. Above it will be a large, smaller will be a smaller disc size. What is more practical now, because now most of us are using sit lamp and we use high plus lenses, you can actually measure the size of the disc using a narrow sit beam. And using these correction factors, depending on what lens you're using, for example, suppose I use a 90D lens, so I can multiply by 1.3 and I can get an idea what is the average size of the disc. As a time passes and you're seeing disc regularly, by experience, you can say this is a smaller disc, this is a large disc. Actual measurement may not, be, may not be required in every patient, but an overview that, okay, I'm dealing with a larger disc, so a large cup is normal, or I'm dealing with a smaller disc, I need to be extra careful, look beyond the cup, try to see subtle changes of glaucoma will be important. Now coming to the second rule, identify the neuroretinal rim. In current glaucoma practice, the neuroretinal rim is more important than the cup. We have to see whether there is any tearing, any excavation in the neuroretinal rim. We are aware about the ISMP rule. In a normal disc, the inferior rim is thicker than the superior than the nasal and the temporal rim. But we have to understand almost 25 to 30% of our patients do not fo uh, follow the ISNT rule. We have to look for any rim thinning. A notching basically is the area where the neuroretinal rim loss is there. And because of the loss, the cup has extended to that place. So you can see there is a superior loss here. The neuroretinal rim is extremely thinned out. Plus you can see a superior RNFL thinning also. In this patient, you can see there is an inferior loss of rim. You can see in very it's very subtle, but you can make out some RNFL thinning inferiorly. Another very important thing is the color of neuroretinal rim. In general, every glaucoma patient, the remaining neuroretinal rim is almost always pink. You don't see white or pale rim in a glaucoma patient. However, certain types of glaucoma, for example, patient with very high pressure like acute angle closure attack or patient who have got UVIT glaucoma, who has got associated uh, maybe a papillitis. These patients, you can have a pallor of neuroretinal rim, but generally we'll see glaucoma patient, the rim will be pink. For example, this patient, you can see the rim is extremely pale. So pallor is a very strong sign that you probably are dealing something beyond glaucoma. So this is a particular study, which is being a landmark study in archive of thermal where they have analyzed the key factors indicating glaucoma and non glaucomatal disc and they found that pallor to be almost 94% specific for non glaucomatal cupping and focal and rim loss is almost 87% specific for glaucoma so take home message is whenever you see pallor try to exclude non glaucomatous causes before you jump into the diagnosis of glaucoma I'll give you a certain example like post neurotic optic atrophy we can, where you can have pallor with secondary cupping. Traumatic optic neuropathy, you can see one eye, the disc is pale, the other eye, the disc is normal. Again, when you see a unilateral presentation, try to look for secondary causes, try to look for non glaucomatous causes. A comprehensive optic neuropathy where you can have a classical damage. So the third R is the examination of the retinal nerve fiber layer. Again, it's extremely, extremely vital. You can do an examination by a high plus lens on a sit lamp. For a better evaluation, you can use a red free light or a green light, which can give you a better assessment of the retinal nerve fiber. What we need to look at is look, try to look for striations, try to look for the brightness of the nerve fiber layer, and also look for any diffuse or localized loss of the retinal nerve fiber layer. This is a normal pattern, how the retinal nerve fiber converge at the optic disc. And these are the bright striations which we normally see in a patient with a normal and healthy retinal nerve fiber layer. You can see a normal RNFL bright striations can be seen. And this is a patient with a diffuse loss. You can see there is no striations, no RNFL can be assessed and the blood vessels are appearing to be bare. You can see it's a totally lusterless uh, retina, which is indicating of a diffuse loss of retinal nerve fiber layer. What is more commonly seen is the localized loss, especially in early glaucoma. So you need to find out these areas of localized loss of RNFL. We can often see wedge-like defect following the pattern of the retinal nerve fiber layer. Again, the fourth thing is the region of parapapillary atrophy. Again, 
in the parapapillary area, you have the alpha zone and the beta zone. What we are more concerned is the beta zone, especially for glaucoma point of view. These are the atrophy of retinal pigment epithelium and choriocapillaries. Again, these are more common in glaucoma eyes. Uh, see that as the time progresses, you will see a gradually increase in the beta zone. And the fifth thing is the retinal disc hemorrhages. You can see these flame cell hemorrhages which are present in the prelamellar layer. So basically this indicate that maybe there is a possibility of glaucoma progression. You try to look into systemic factors also. Sometimes these hemorrhages can be seen without glaucoma also. For example, in patients with optic disc drusen, patient with uh, posterior vitreous detachment, often patient with diabetes or hypertension also. But in established glaucoma, this is an indirect evidence that you might be having a progression in glaucoma. This photography sometimes is extremely crucial for these patients. Like this particular patient on a routine disc evaluation, we missed the disc hemorrhage. But when we took a disc photograph, there was a very small disc hemorrhage which we could locate. So a good disc photograph can be useful to give you an extra information compared to a routine disc evaluation. We should also be aware of conditions which can mimic glaucoma like a coloboma or a tilted disc or a drusen or optic disc pit. These should be kept in mind. Also have a complete evaluation of the fundus. Sometimes we're just looking at the disc, it may look like a cupped disc, but when you see in detail, you can see there is a coloboma inferiorly. So before stamping a patient in glaucoma, have a complete fundus evaluation and always correlate your disc finding with your visual fields and your OCT finding before you stamp the patient as glaucoma. So before I end, I just like to share a few clinical examples. This is the first patient. So we'll just follow the five R which we have been discussing. The first is the stellar ring. So in this case, it's a small disc. You can see the rim thinning. The second R, you can see the rim thinning is there. Third R is the RNFL defect. You can see the RNFL defect inferiorly. There's no peripapillary atrophy, but yes, there is a hemorrhage. So there are multiple signs indicating that definitely there are signs of glaucoma. So this is a glaucomatous disc. Another patient, average side disc. You can see the neuroretinal rim is healthy. There is no obvious RNFL thinning. There is no peripapillary atrophy and there is no disc hemorrhage. So this is a normal disc. Third case, you can see very clearly there is a thinning of neuroretinal rim superiorly and inferiorly and average size disc with a notching superiorly and inferiorly. Third R, RNFL loss. Yes, you can see RNFL loss superiorly and inferiorly. Peripapillary atrophy is there, but small, not very really significant. There is no hemorrhages, but the notching and RNFL loss indicate that this is the patient of glaucoma. Fourth patient, again, you can see the disc size is average. There is inferior thinning. You can see the inferior, there is sloping and thinning inferiorly. There is a diffuse RNFL loss. You know, obvious RNFL loss here. Small area of peripapillary atrophy is there. Again, not very really significant and there is no disc hemorrhage. But based on the inferior thinning, again, you have to correlate with your disc finding if there is a loss or not. Is the time over? Yes, so the schedule time so, is up sure. if Thank you would so, like to. So I just, anyway, it's over. I just come to my concluding side. Yes, sir. So to conclude, I'll say it's extremely important disc evaluation for your diagnosis. Also, we need to see that IOP fluctuates. You have a, a dependency on the performance in case of visual field, but disc is extremely crucial. Have to have patience, need to practice it regularly and need to look for these subtle signs. Always try to do a dilated evaluation so that you cannot miss these findings. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Manish. I think that was wonderfully done. He has really beautifully covered uh, the mm -hmm. entire disc. And uh, I just want to reiterate one or two points for the PGs. Please always see the disc with dilatation. Because otherwise you will make mistakes, especially if you are a beginner. Always use the red free light to catch the wedge defects or even otherwise. Because sometimes you will not be able to make out the pallor and the changes. Always, like Manisha has explained to you, check the size, check the isn't rule. It is the NRR which you are working at. Okay, and if you have the disc hemorrhage, yes. So at least the gross size you should be able to make out. Every day I see patients whose cataract has been done, but the disc has not been looked. And we then get one-eyed patients. <clears throat> For God's sake, all PGs, everybody, you have to dilate a patient 
to see these things.